Welcome to A Good Night for a Murder, a Victorian true crime podcast. My name is Kim, and I know you're all here for a good Victorian murder story, but buckle up for this one, folks. It is not for the faint of heart. The subject of tonight's story is sometimes referred to as the female Sweeney Todd. And if you don't know, Sweeney Todd is a famous fictional character who first appeared in 1846 in Penny Dreadful Publications. The character was a barber that would slit the throat of his clients so his partner in crime could bake their bodies into pies and sell them to the unexpecting public. But that is fiction. Tonight's story is rooted in real events. This is the story of Kate Webster. But first, a Victorian society tip. A good housemaid will rise at six and have her grates cleaned and room swept by seven. She will then go upstairs, wash her hands, and make herself tidy for taking to the bedroom hot water if required to do so. In the meantime, the dust will have settled and the rooms will be ready on her return to be finished by 8. By 9 o'clock, breakfast ought to be cleared away and the housemaid ready to strip the beds, empty slops, and set the bedrooms in order. By 11 o'clock, the upstairs work ought to be done unless extra cleaning is in question. Washing up china and glass, dusting the drawing room, and other light labor of the kind may take till 12 or 1 o'clock, by which time a housemaid ought to be dressed for the day fit to answer the door, wait on the family, and do needlework. Any work required of the servant after midday should be of a nature not to soil her garments. At dusk, it is a housemaid's place to close all the windows at the upper part of the house. Before going to bed, she has to turn down all beds of the family, replenish ewers and water bottles, empty slops, and put everything in its place. If she has charge of the plate basket, she carries it to the master's room together with hot water. Considerate employers will dispense with the housemaid's attendance by 10 o'clock, bearing in mind her morning duties. Julia Martha Thomas, a retired school teacher living in 1879 Richmond, London, England, was looking to take on a live-in domestic servant. At the age of about 54 and having been widowed twice, Mrs. Thomas didn't have a very grand home. She lived in a suburban area in a two-story, semi-detached villa, but she did enjoy the finer things in life. And all affluent ladies, or at least those wanting to appear affluent, had live-in domestic servants. But she had a bit of a problem keeping help. She was petite in stature, but big in her opinions and personality. Though she was considered a member of lower middle class society, she liked to wear elegant gowns and fine jewelry that gave the impression that she was wealthier than she actually was. She was regarded by her neighbors as eccentric and described as having an excitable temperament. She had a habit of spontaneously traveling for long periods of time, often not telling anyone where she was going. This, coupled with the fact that it sounds like she was kind of a demanding nitpickety boss, made for tenuous relationships with her hired help. So, when a woman named Kate Webster stood in for one of Mrs. Thomas's friend's usual maids, the friend recommended Kate to Mrs. Thomas. Mrs. Thomas did run a background check on Kate first, which turned up some prior convictions for theft, but her friend assured her Kate was an excellent worker, and Mrs. Thomas hired her anyway. So, here is some of what did not turn up in Kate's background check. She was born as Kate Lawler in 1849 in County Wexford, Ireland. She was born into a lower class, but by all accounts, respectable family. As a teenager, though, she started to give her family some trouble. She developed a bit of a habit of stealing, and at the age of 15, she was imprisoned for a few weeks for larceny. She continued to steal as means to fund the purchase of a train ticket so she could move to Liverpool in 1867 when she's 18. She lives in Liverpool for a year, continuing to get by, mostly on theft, it seems, when she's arrested again a year later and sentenced to penal servitude for four years. She's released and travels to London, where she works as a cleaner and maid. Sometime during this period, she claims she married a sea captain and had four children by him, but they all died in a terrible accident. I mean, she makes up a lot of stuff apparently, so who knows, but this is how she took on the last name Webster. At one point, she gets a job cleaning in a boarding house and starts a fun side hustle where she secretly rents out some of the rooms and keeps the money for herself. 
She also steals and sells whatever she can out of the rooms. She had an accomplice for this, maybe? A man by the last name of Strong, who she says fathered a son she gives birth to in 1874. Though she did name up to two or three other men as her son's father at different times as well. For the boarding house scam, she's eventually convicted of 36 counts of larceny in 1875. She claimed she was forsaken by her son's father and was forced to commit those crimes to support herself and her child. Based on her history, I'd wager she was a willing participant, but again, who really knows? Either way, she spent 18 months in prison. She gets out, and by 1877, she's convicted of larceny again and spends another year in prison. She had a friend who also worked as a maiden cleaner who would take care of her son during her time in prison. Now, this is the same friend that she stood in for as a maid that got her the referral to Mrs. Thomas. So Kate starts working for Mrs. Thomas, and at first it's going well. But in a matter of weeks, the situation starts to deteriorate. Kate would later say, At first I thought her a nice old lady, but I found her very trying, and she used to do many things to annoy me during my work. When I had finished my work in my rooms, she used to go over it again after me and point out places where she said I did not clean, showing evidence of a nasty spirit towards me. It seems like Mrs. Thomas was used to having her servants being more submissive, but Kate was not cut from the same cloth as the maids before her. She would often get into arguments with Mrs. Thomas and walk out on doing her work to go to the local pub and then come home later drunk and fight with her employer some more. Mrs. Thomas actually became fearful of Kate and started asking friends to stay the night in her house so she wouldn't have to be alone with her. Eventually, she plucks up the courage to fire Kate, and in the very last diary entry she ever recorded on February 28, she writes, gave Catherine warning to leave. For some reason that's unknown to us, Kate asks Mrs. Thomas if she'll keep her on through the end of the week, meaning Sunday, March 2nd. Maybe for a little bit more money, maybe because she was plotting something? We'll circle back to that. Either way, Mrs. Thomas agrees and for her last day, asks Kate to help her prepare for an evening service at church. But Kate had been at the pub again and returns late, making Mrs. Thomas late for church, and she is not pleased about it. They argue, and Mrs. Thomas tells her something to the effect that she won't be paying her for that day, and when she gets back from church, Kate better be gone. About 9 p.m., Mrs. Thomas returns from church and finds Kate still there. Mrs. Thomas goes upstairs and Kate goes up after her. They're arguing, they're fighting, and in a fit of rage, Kate throws Mrs. Thomas from the top of the stairs down to the ground floor. But she's still alive, and in a panic to keep her from screaming, Kate grabs her by the throat and chokes her and throws her down on the floor again until Mrs. Thomas is dead. The neighbors hear a single loud thud, like a chair falling over, and they completely disregard it. So Kate has a body to get rid of. Here's where it starts to get a little grisly. I'm just going to read you Kate's account of what she did next. I determined to do away with the body as best I could. I chopped the head from the body with the assistance of a razor, which I used to cut through the flesh afterwards. I also used the meat saw and the carving knife to cut the body up with. I prepared the copper with water to boil the body to prevent identity. And as soon as I had succeeded in cutting it up, I placed it in the copper and boiled it. I opened the stomach with the carving knife and burned up as much of the parts as I could. The copper she refers to is an early washing machine used for laundry. You would fill the inner part with water and lay a fire underneath to boil it. During the boiling project, she takes a break goes to the local pub. When everything is finished simmering, she packs each piece into a cloth bag, wraps it in paper, and begins piece by piece packing Mrs. Thomas into a wooden box and a Gladstone bag, which is kind of like a rigid leather weekender sized bag. She runs out of room for one foot and Mrs. Thomas's head and sets those aside to get rid of some other way. And then she gets to work cleaning the kitchen and the hallway. Didn't the neighbors notice some kind of a smell? Yes, of course they did. Did they tell anyone? No, they never do. The next day, she burned whatever bones were left in the fireplace, then takes a walk to the pawnbroker to pawn Mrs. Thomas's gold bridge work. Does the pawnbroker ask, where is the person whose mouth you got this bridge work out of? 
I guess they didn't. On her way back, she stops at another local pub and has a few drinks there. Okay, we're getting to the Sweeney Todd part I mentioned at the top of the episode. Here we go. So, I'm vegetarian, and I guess when you boil meat, the fat melts and floats to the top, and you need to skim it off. So, Kate had this byproduct of boiling up Mrs. Thomas to deal with. And this was never proven, but it was widely rumored that in the days following the murder, Kate was going around town in the neighborhood trying to sell drippings and lard to anyone who would talk to her. And people bought it. She was offering it around at the pub she stopped in and even two children she encountered playing in the street as a snack. So she takes the one foot that wouldn't fit in the bags and throws it in a rubbish pile in another town that's about a 40-minute walk away. And she buries the head under the stables of a pub just down the road from the home. So now she starts devising a scheme. She puts on one of Mrs. Thomas's silk dresses and she decides she is Mrs. Thomas now. She goes to visit an old neighbor and on her way there she throws the bag of body parts into the Thames River. She arrives at her old neighbor's place and she tells them that since she's seen them last, she's gotten married and is Mrs. Thomas now, had a son, then been widowed, and has also been left a house in Richmond by a wealthy aunt who recently passed. And she's wondering, do they know anyone who might want to buy all of the furniture from the house? Oh, and by the way, could their boy come and help her move a heavy box she has? Kate's old friends say, well, sure, we know a man named John Church who was opening a pub and he needs lots of things. He might be interested. We'll send him your way. And sure thing, our son can help you move that box. Son, go help Mrs. Thomas move that box. And they send their son off with Kate back to the house. The boy helps her move the box to a bridge where she tells him, this is far enough. I have someone coming to meet me here to take it. And he turns around and he goes on his way. He hears a loud splash as he's walking off, but he doesn't think anything of it. He probably just wanted to get home because kids, you know. A day later, the box washes up down the river. Someone spots it, opens it up, and calls the police. Shortly thereafter, a foot is found, and the police rightfully conclude it belongs to the same person who is in the box. But they don't have the head, and they never recover the bag with the rest of the body, so they can't identify the victim. A doctor incorrectly concludes they belong to a young person with very dark hair. And it's speculated that the body was used for a dissection and anatomical study, and the unidentified remains were laid to rest in the Barnes Cemetery in Richmond. So Kate's old neighbors do send John Church by, and he is interested in buying a lot of the furniture and other items from the house. So they make arrangements for him to come back for the cart and pick it up. It's been about two weeks now. And Mrs. Thomas's neighbors are starting to become a little suspicious, but she had taken off in the past suddenly on trips before, so it wasn't entirely unusual. But when a cart shows up to collect the furniture from her place, the next door neighbor asks the driver who made this arrangement, and when he answers Mrs. Thomas, referring to Kate, the neighbor calls the police. Kate realizes she's been found out and flees. She collects her son and runs back to Ireland. The police investigate the house and discover blood stains, charred bone, and fatty deposits behind the copper. They also find a letter of Kate's with her home address in Ireland. Officials track her to her uncle's farm in Ireland, where she is still wearing Mrs. Thomas's clothes and jewelry, and she is arrested there on March 29th. She is then taken back to London and charged with murder. As soon as the news of such a ghastly crime broke, it was a sensation. People traveled to Richmond to look at the house. Wherever Kate was transported, people gathered and lined the roads to gawk and jeer at her. The pretrial proceedings were attended by, quote, many privileged and curious persons. And it was reported upon Kate's first appearance at Richmond's Magistrate Court that an immense crowd gathered around the building and very great excitement prevailed. Madame Toussaint's Wax Museum even immediately started working on a wax replica of Kate for their Chamber of Horrors. The trial itself lasted six days and was very well attended from all levels of society, including the attendance of the Crown Prince of Sweden. Kate pled not guilty and throughout the trial appeared stoic and impassive, which did not work in her favor. 
One of the most damning testimonies was that of a bonnet maker named Maria Durden, who stated that Kate had visited her a week before the murder took place, talking about how she was planning on selling some property, jewelry, and a house a recently deceased aunt had left her. Remember earlier we talked about what reason Kate could have for asking to stay on three more days with Mrs. Thomas? The story about the aunt who recently passed was the same when she told her old neighbors after the deed was already done. If Kate did kill Mrs. Thomas unexpectedly in a fit of rage, why was she going around telling the aunt's story a week before? This would indicate premeditated murder. Though the evidence was largely circumstantial, she tried to implicate her old neighbors and also John Church, who she tried to sell the furniture to, but it didn't work, and it took the jurors only an hour and 15 minutes to render a verdict of guilty. Now, Kate is about to drop a bit of a bombshell on everyone. When the judge asks her, is there any reason she should not be sentenced to death, she replies that she is pregnant. This is a stop the presses problem for the court. Here, they have this brutal murderer who people are chomping at the bit to see her get what she deserves, and she could be pregnant. They cannot send a pregnant woman to the gallows. So they take a beat, and someone suggests employing a jury of matrons. By this time, a jury of matrons was considered an archaic practice because it was widely regarded as unreliable and unethical. How it usually went down was a group of women were selected from those viewing the court proceedings, and it was their job to examine the accused and determine if she was quick with child. Quick with child specifically means she was at the point in her pregnancy where she could feel the baby moving. If she was determined to be quick with child, often the sentence would be delayed or commuted. Now, as I mentioned, this tactic has really fallen out of favor and was problematic for many reasons. First, the women selected were not doctors or midwives. It was just women who happened to be there. Often, the accused would just plant women they were friends with in the courtroom. Then when a jury of matrons was invoked, they would just say, yep, she's pregnant, even if she wasn't, and the sentence would be lessened. Second, only the mother can feel the quickening at first. It's often described as a fluttering sensation, so the method employed by the jury of matrons was largely guesswork at best. And third, the quickening doesn't happen until roughly 17 to 20 weeks into a pregnancy. One is obviously pregnant before they feel the quickening, and the fact that women who were possibly just earlier in their pregnancy were being executed by following this jury of matrons method really upset people. Beyond that, some women prisoners while waiting for their trial would try to become pregnant by their jailers in an effort to save themselves from harsher sentencing, and the courts did not appreciate being manipulated in this way. So this revelation just added more flame to the fire for this trial, and a jury of 12 women, including one surgeon, were escorted to a private room to examine Kate. It took only a couple of minutes for the entire party to return shortly after and render a verdict that no, Kate was not quick with child and she was sentenced to hang. Her execution is scheduled, and the night before, she makes a full confession to the prison chaplain. By this time, executions were carried out behind the prison walls, not in public, and Kate was hanged at 9 a.m. on July 29, 1879. A black flag was risen over the prison to indicate the sentence had been carried out, and the crowds outside the prison walls cheered. Kate was only the second out of 135 people and the only woman who would ever be executed there, and she was buried in the prison yard. The prison yard held spots for 90 graves, meaning they had to start reusing graves for later executions. I guess this means they doubled up on the people buried in there, but they did not reuse Kate's since she was a woman. Chivalrous of them. The day after the execution, an auction of Mrs. Thomas's property is held and people turn out in droves. The laundry copper and carving knife used in her murder are sold, as well as countless other items from the house, and those who could not afford to purchase items took stones and twigs from her yard with them. The house stood empty for the next 18 years, after which I guess it was purchased as a private residence, which it still is today. Now, if you've been paying attention, there is an open plot point in the story. I said... The box containing parts of Mrs. Thomas washed up down the river. The one foot that wouldn't fit in the bag or the box was found, and the second bag of body parts was never found. But I mentioned that Kate buried Mrs. Thomas's skull. How do we know that? Well, in 1852, Sir David Attenborough, 
that's right, the famous naturalist, filmmaker, and environmentalist, purchased a property for he and his wife near the famous home of Kate and Mrs. Thomas. In 2007, an adjacent pub closed down and Attenborough purchased it with plans to demolish and redevelop the plot in 2009. In 2010, over 130 years after the murder of Mrs. Thomas, during the excavation work, they find a skull. So when this happens, all work must stop and the police must be called to determine if there has been a crime committed or if the remains found hold some archaeological significance, usually meaning grave sites. And in this case, we have both. Carbon dating places a skull to have been from between 1650 and 1880, though it was found on top of a layer of Victorian-era tiles, lending more confidence that it was from that time period. Collagen levels in the bones are consistent with having been boiled, and fracture marks are consistent with that of being thrown down the stairs. DNA testing is not possible as Mrs. Thomas had no children and there is no record of where her remains are buried in the Barnes Cemetery, but in 2011, the coroner concluded the skull was indeed that of Mrs. Thomas. I wondered what they did with the skull thereafter, you know, as you do, and I found one source that states it was buried in an unmarked grave in Richmond Cemetery, which is a different cemetery than where the rest of her remains were buried. I don't know why they wouldn't try to bury it in at least the same cemetery, but I guess there were reasons and the two cemeteries are only about 10 minutes apart from one another. I have some photos for you, including photos of Kate and Mrs. Thomas, some courtroom and newspaper illustrations, the murder house, and the skull that was found. You can also see the photos on Instagram and TikTok at A Good Night for a Murder and on the episode blog, plus all source links on my website, a goodnightforamurder.com. The bonus content for Housekeeper and Butler tier patrons for this episode are some excerpts from an 1845 satire piece dispensing advice to housemaids, which is somehow still entirely relatable today. It's funny. I hope you like it. To subscribe to Patreon and learn more about the podcast, you can visit a goodnightforamurder.com and also follow me on Instagram or TikTok at a goodnightforamurder. Please rate and review and share with friends. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again soon.